Hello and welcome to this clip on chirality in organic molecules. We'll start by looking at the basis of optical activity and enantiomers in optical isomerism, which is a type of stereoisomerism. We'll then go on to look at how to identify a chiral carbon in an optical isomer. And then finally, go and have a look at some of the important consequences of optical, optical isomerism in pharmacological effectiveness and safety of synthetic drugs in medicine. Throughout the clip, we'll be assuming that you have already come across stereoisomerism, so it's not the first time you've heard of this word, because this is an application of stereoisomerism. So let's look first of all at how optical activity works. To make this make sense, we need to think about light in terms of photons. So we obviously imagine light travelling in a straight line. The theory of photons is uh, basically, that light is consisted of small packets of energy. I mean, this is a very oversimplified expl explanation. I'm not going to go into the physics of it. But if you imagine that photons travel as waveforms, like that. Now, if we were to imagine that that was one photon travelling, a red photon travelling in that way, we could imagine that the waveform took an up and a down movement, an up and a down um, format. If we then took a blue photon, but it moved at a slightly different angle, the plane of its movement, of its up and down movement, would be different to the plane of the movement of the red photon. So it can be said that the two photons move in different planes to each other. Now obviously, those aren't the only two planes that photons can move in. Photons can move in lots and lots of different planes. So if we start at the left-hand side of the diagram, normal visible light has photons travelling in all different planes at the same time. If that light passes through a polarising filter, only one plane of light can pass through. This is now called plane polarised light. So if we pass this plane polarised light through a sample of an optically active compound, the two isomers of the optically active molecule rotate the plane polarised light in opposite directions. So if the sample we're using happens to contain one, uh, more of one isomer than the other, we can see this effect visually. However, if the sample contains equal amounts, they cancel each other's effect out and we don't see any effect with our naked eyes. This type of mixture would be called a racemic mixture. It would have 50-50 amounts of each. So a chiral molecule will have four separate groups around one particular carbon atom. So if we take the highlighted carbon, you can see that there's four separate groups around that carbon. So it's easy to see that this is a chiral molecule. So the important thing is that chiral molecules exist as two enantiomers. Each enantiomer will rotate plane polarised light in the opposite direction as the other. These are stereoisomers uh, and they're non-superimposable mirror images of each other. If you try it with your hands, if you place your hands on top of each other, they won't be superimposable. To try and help demonstrate, I've taken a picture of my two hands, so sorry about that. Um, they're a bit ugly, but never mind. If you imagine putting one on top of the other, the thumbs will be on opposite sides to each other. They won't automatically superimpose. So this is how you spot stereoisomerism. If you look at the versions on this, this screen, you'll see what I mean. So if we look at the uh, version right to the left of the photographs, I've highlighted the chiral carbon because there's four different groups coming off that carbon. That's how you can tell if you've got an optically active um, chiral molecule. When we manufacture chiral molecules in the lab, Usually equal amounts of each enantiomer are made. If only one of the enantiomers is either pharmacologically effective or indeed safe, then we have to separate out the one that's dangerous or ineffective. We use fractional distillation or chromatography to do this, but this is time-consuming and expensive. And as such, it adds to the cost of drugs and medicines. Bacteria and fungi, like many other living things, 
have evolved over the years to produce only the effect of an antiomer in their biochemical pathways. So what we've started to do is to harvest these molecules from bacteria and fungal cultures to avoid having to do the separation ourselves later. So this technique is called chiral pool synthesis. At the moment we have a pool of pharmacologically active and safe precursor molecules to use. So if we use these molecules early enough in the stages of the synthesis of a new medicine, we avoid wasting time and money producing ineffective or unsafe enantiomers of our target molecule. And this saving can be passed on to healthcare providers. Uh, so in a ideal world, obviously, the, pharmace the pharmaceutical companies would pass on the savings, uh, retain the profits, but at the same time uh, be able to produce um, medicines at a lower cost to the end user. So let's take a closer look at what happens. So starting at the top left of the screen you can see a chiral carbon within a more complex molecule. Bearing in mind that it's a skeletal formula, don't forget that you'll also have a hydrogen coming off that chiral carbon. So now you have one, two, three, four different groups coming off it as such. I'll take those labels and annotations off to go to clutter up the page a little bit. So if we look at an effect of an antiomer, it's going to fully engage with the receptor molecules in a target cell. Whereas the ineffect of an antiomer doesn't fully engage with the receptor molecule, as you can see, the shapes don't add up. It's a little bit more complex than that, obviously, but this is a simplification diagrammatically. So moving to the molecule at the bottom of the page, this is a medicine called thalidomide. It prevents morning sickness in pregnant mothers, but only one enantiomer of it does this. The other enantiomer caused birth defects in the unborn child in the 1950s to 1970s with doses that were prescribed and given out by doctors. Inadvertently, the doctors themselves didn't know this, but they contained both. So it not only prevented um, morning sickness, but the other enantiomer that was also present would cause birth defects in the unborn child. This was obviously a major scandal for the manufacturer of the drug at the time. So chiral pool synthesis that we talked about a little bit earlier was developed to try and prevent this kind of tragedy happening again. So let's now look at an exam question on chirality. This is a section of an exam question. You wouldn't have a whole exam question on chirality. You might have a, a one marker or a two marker on it. So it asks you to identify the chiral centre and the structure of malic acid using an asterisk. So you can clearly see that the carbon I've put an asterisk next to has four different groups coming off it, which I've highlighted just to illustrate. So the next thing they want you to do is to draw a diagram to show the 3D arrangement of groups around the chiral centre. Now obviously the chiral centre is a carbon atom, it's got four bonds around it, so it's going to have a tetrahedral arrangement. So that's what I'd put in, or that's what I'd advise putting in, with the wedges and the dashed lines to show the 3D arrangement. So now let's bring the page down to see our answers and see if they're okay. So you can see quite clearly that we've got the right one. And it says correct use of structure with at least three, uh, three uh, at least two 3D bonds. Oh, I didn't read that properly, did I? There you go. And I think we chose uh, well, the example we chose didn't have either of those, but we did have this idea. I think what they're after is the idea that you have four groups like that. Just to clarify that. Because it says EG, it doesn't mean they're the only two that you can have. Our one's slightly different, but we do have this. So we got that mark as well. So hopefully this has been a fairly useful introduction to what chirality is. And it takes, it takes you through some extension stuff as well in terms of the, um, the pharmaceutical aspect of it. And how to draw optical isomers as well. Uh, so if you have any queries about this, please bring them in to your teacher or maybe come in to see one of us in a subject extension. 
But in the meantime, thanks for your time, thanks for your patience, and uh, hopefully see you soon.